the perfect recipe for the perfect movie is probably Scorsese alongside his biggest stars like DiCaprio and De Niro. Then we see what De Niro actually do. It's slapping DiCaprio's ass in the movie in a way of like saying, I am Scorsese's best friend, not you. But jokes aside, I believe I just witnessed one of the best films of my life, possibly my favorite from this fantastic director. Let's talk about everything you need to know about this film, Killers of the Flower Moon. I just saw it at the premiere and I'll start with a spoiler free review and then dive into a more in-depth analysis of the film and my prediction for its potential awards. But first, don't forget to subscribe to our channel to support us and be sure to hit the like button if you enjoyed the video. It was a lot of work to do this video but I love doing it and let's go with this video. In today's cinema, there are only a few projects where I see a trailer and instantly feel the urge to go to the theater without even considering that the film might be bad. For me, there are only three directors who achieved this. Tarantino, Nolan, and of course Scorsese. Not only is he the director of my favorite film of all time, The Wolf of Wall Street, but he's also behind fantastic movies that redefine the genres they delve into. If you ask me to define a Scorsese film, I would say it's a movie that deeply engages you in the story, delivers outstanding performances from the actors, and in the case of DiCaprio, he consistently shines under Scorsese's mentorship. Scorsese is a master at crafting gangster films and classics like Goodfellas, The Irishman and Gangs of New York showcase his prowess in directing and acting. Even though his new film isn't directly about gangsters, the genre's influence is evident throughout the whole movie. For those unfamiliar with the story, Killers of the Flower Moon is based on a true story from the early 20th century in the United States. It revolves around the Osage people, an indigenous group that owed valuable land with oil reserves, making them incredibly wealthy. The films explore the conflicts between the Osage, their land, and the encroachment of white settlers, resulting in a series of gruesome murders. I won't give away any spoilers in this section, so I'll be more precise in my analysis. In my opinion, the film is nearly perfect. It's adamantly long, with a runtime of around 3 hours and 20 minutes, but I was glued to the screen the entire time. The story is expertly narrated, the actor's performances are incredible, and Leonardo DiCaprio delivers a performance that arguably it's one of the best of his career with a strong potential for an Oscar win, and I'll talk about the Oscars in the end of the video. Robert De Niro, despite being in his 80s, delivers a remarkable performance as well. He exudes charisma and commands respect, reminiscent of his iconic gangster roles. The film's strong gangster influence is evident in how they handle situations within the Osage people, with ruthless elimination of their targets, similar to the gangster movies in the 70s and the 80s. Scorsese excels in crafting these stories. The cinematography in the film is outstanding, immersing you in the setting with period accurate cars, costumes. The film beautifully integrates mystical elements from Osage culture, fostering a deeper connection with the people. What surprised me the most was how the trailer didn't fully represent the film's dynamic pacing and intricate narrative. The story is far more complex than I initially expected, creating well-rounded and meticulously crafted characters. Now that I've discussed the spoiler-free section, let's delve into a more comprehensive analysis of this story and explore the references you encounter throughout the movie. Firstly, one thing the director brilliantly brings to life is how, when placed in different positions in films, we begin to notice incredibly nuances in behavior. We're not accustomed to seeing indigenous minorities in positions of power in today's society, so witnessing the strong development of his indigenous society and their social prominence, especially financially, compared to the white settlers arriving in the regions, is striking. Inside their homes, for instance, the maids are white, which contradicts historical norms as we usually see minorities undertaking less valued work. This might make it seem like you're an entirely different reality, which of course isn't a perspective of prejudice, but rather an acknowledgement of how different and in their own way good their lives were before it was gradually taken away. We also see the normalization of prejudices in the society similar to prejudices against African Americans, which isn't presented as a problem because it's simply a normalized aspect of that society. This becomes evident during a parade and festival in the town where one of the participating groups is the actual KKK. These individuals who are also part of the workforce wear white robes with white and hoods and the evolution of their attire reveals the change in societal norms. At first, the hoods 
don't conceal their faces, indicating their pride in their racist beliefs. It's a stark portrayal of deeply rooted prejudice within that world. The film also captures the time of the American Prohibition era, when the use of alcoholic beverages was prohibited. This resulted in clandestine production of moonshine and beverage so poorly made that it could be even blind you, demonstrating the extent of the underground alcohol trade. I previously mentioned how the film echoes elements of the gangster genre. The murders committed in the society are reminiscent of the way mobsters would eliminate their enemies. They either killed in broad daylight and or left the bodies openly on display without fear of being identified. External individuals brought in by indigenous people to resolve their issues were either threatened or murdered to prevent the discussion of these indigenous deaths. What also made it easier for those people to die was the fragile state of their health. Due to their deeply rooted traditional customs, many resistant tanking medications are adhering to sanitary practice that at least traditional society might have followed. This is exemplified by William, who comments that reaching 50 is considered old among the indigenous people, and you can see it in the appearance of Molly's mother, who looks much older than her years. One aspect that generally surprised me when comparing the trailer to the film was the revelation that Ernest had a certain level of intellectual disability and was involved in these murder cases. The trailer suggests that he and Molly are together trying to overcome everything, but in reality he is involved in the massacre of their people. It's evident that he has a strong duality, he supports his wife but also feels manipulated by his uncle, the only family figure in his life. This vulnerability in Ernest is what makes his character incredibly complex and well-crafted. His mental illness makes him more susceptible to manipulation which he endures from his uncle. This manipulation becomes clear as the film progresses, leading to a deeper understanding of all the perspectives by the end of the movie. Now I would like to point out two fantastic film references that help put this movie into perspective. There will be Blood and The Northman. If you've never seen those two movies, you might have already grasped what I'm getting at it, but if you haven't, you are missing out and you should definitely watch both of them. I bring up There Will Be Blood because it contains many allegories related to oil exploration. The film explores the growth of a society economically due to the discovery of oil reserves and there are scenes where oil gushes out, catches fire and visually portrays it as if the earth is regurgitating something harmful. This emphasizes the idea that economic benefit in one place doesn't necessarily equate to overall well-being for the population. Assassin of the Flower Moon similarly delves into this concept that people arriving just don't bring development. They also parasite the existing society by forcibly taking their land. And now, the Northman enters the discussion between its reach and references to Norse culture, Valhalla, and gods. The film incorporates mystical symbolism such as the scene when the main character passes away, symbolizing his journey to Valhalla. This idea transitions into the old such culture in Assassins of the Flower Moon. For instance, when the mother visualizes an owl, which traditionally symbolizes independent death, it's a powerful symbol. Then there's a scene at an event where she's about to pass away, transitioning to a sequence with three enigmatic figures who don't speak but justify her departure. She joins them in silence and the absence of a soundtrack makes this moment deeply impactful as it's meant for contemplation. It's a very, very powerful scene highlighting the Osage culture. A significant aspect of this film is that what is based on a true story, so there isn't much that's invented. The ending is not forgiving to Ernest, while he did have his mental disabilities, he's aware to a certain extent that he is engaged in inhuman acts, causing the death of innocent people and harming his own family. He goes through a transformation during the story, realizing the impact of his actions. He is not exactly a hero or a villain, but falls more towards the latter, and that's what Scorsese likes to work, he doesn't like to go with other hero appearances or villains, he likes to work in this grey area of familiarity. Ernest fate, which involves imprisonment and then living in a trailer with his brother in his later life, remains a consistent with his character, Molly's destiny, battling diabetes in those times, ultimately leads to her death. Even William, which is the king, being sentenced and imprisoned doesn't compare to the losses on the other side, thus it's safe to say that the film is a powerful, well-executed depiction of a grim period in history. 
There's much more to discuss about this film, but well, that would take us away from the main topic. These are my perspectives of the movie, and I do plan to watch it again. It's not a lighthearted film for laughter, but it's a deeply moving drama with romance woven throughout, crafted by a truly magical director who is an absolute cinematic genius. It had a more significant impact on me than I expected, and it's generally better than I imagined. Regarding awards, I'm betting that DiCaprio will win the Best Actor category in the Oscars. His performance was unparalleled. I'm not sure about the nearest chances, but even in a nomination would be fantastic. Lily, who portrays Molly, also has a strong potential for Best Actress, but I'm definitely betting on DiCaprio because of how different DiCaprio is from his character and the way he can create mannerisms to his character to make it look way different than it has and make it more you know, believable. And for best film, I'm already expecting it to win. I'm sorry. Best director, absolutely. The film is definitely a masterwork. The soundtrack is excellent, combining classical compositions with elements of Yosage culture. The costume design is impeccable, making it a shining example for the industry. And for me, so yeah, I think that's about it. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please subscribe and I'll bring more content to the channel soon. Give the video a thumbs up if you liked it and I'll see you guys on the next video and of course on the next review. So goodbye and peace.